morning to one and all once again. And I want to again offer my gratitude and honor to Dr. Ben and Sonia Claynards for the kind invitation to share the word of the Lord with you all this morning. Today represents our second session in dealing with the subject of first fruits. In last week, we basically looked at a case study of how the first man who found acceptability with God by virtue of what he gave to God in the person of Abel. And we compared that to God's rejection of his brother's offering in the person of Cain. And we established this fact that a first fruit offering set the foundation in the earliest part of human history for how to give to God. The first example of a human being offering anything to God was a first fruit offering. I again just want to read Hebrews chapter, four, chapter 11 and verse 4. And we are going to again look at a few more principles that we should note in considering the matter of first fruits. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts. And through it, he being dead, still speaks. In last week, we ended our session by focusing on one particular benefit of first fruit giving, which is that God has regard for the man or for the person and the first fruit offering. The first fruit offering finds acceptability with God because the person giving it has already found acceptability with God. Your gifts are acceptable because you are acceptable. And we noted this particular point that God will look with an intense gaze, keen focus upon your life, upon your activity, and will even respond compassionately towards you with huge doses of increased favor and blessing. In the document which I will publish towards the end of this month, I delineate various blessings associated with first fruit offerings. And I will encourage you to study that for your own enlightenment and for your own edification. My focus in these teachings are more to press into the internal principles, it's the inward architecture of what is happening that when we do give a first fruit offering, what is in the internal mechanism and principles driving the administration of this important expression of giving. When Abel gave his offering, his first lings, he had the regard of the Lord. Secondly, I want to focus on he had a witness from God that he was righteous. A witness from God that he was righteous. And thirdly, he was able to transcend human limitations associated with his flesh. In Abel's life, you see these three principles running afoot. God regards him. God testifies that the man is righteous. And God is even able to use his voice beyond the event of his death. He's able to transcend natural or human limitations. Now, I want to focus on the second one. The witness of God that he was righteous. Again, I want to remind you. He gives this first fruit offering. And the scripture says very clearly 
in Hebrews 11 and verse 4, God testifies about His gifts. It is one thing for a man to testify or to witness to, to applaud what you give to God. It is one thing for humans to regard and note what you give. It's another thing completely when God Himself in the heaven stands up in a sense to note and to regard and even to testify, to give utterance or to witness to the accuracy and the power that your first fruit giving represents. God testifies to Abel the man and to his gifts that the man was righteous and the giving of the gift was a righteous thing to do. Now, the subject of righteousness is a vast one. On my website, I have over 23 audio sessions explaining the biblical doctrine of righteousness. Shortly, in succinct fashion, righteousness is simply humans' attempts to comply with God's eternal design that He has already preset or predetermined for you in the heavens from eternity. So here is you and here is God. God has a design for you on the earth. God has standards for every department of your life. Those standards are called righteousness. You on the earth, if you are to be righteous, you've got to take all your attitudes and all your actions, all your behavior and your thought life, and you've got to make certain it complies with God's predetermined presets for your life. So, for example, in marriage, God has a set of principles by which you should conduct your relationship with your spouse. Those are located in His Word. It is not left to you to decide that. You have to discover that in God's Word. And what you do simply is comply. It's like, you, yes, your life, yes, heaven's demand. You, you sink your life exactly to mirror God's expectation of you in the heavens. Jesus wanted John the Baptist to baptize him. John refused. John said, you must baptize me. Jesus said this, suffer it to be so now. For in this way, I must or we must fulfill all righteousness. Now the Bible says that God is righteous in all His ways. Psalm 23, He leads us besides still waters for His namesake. He leads us into paths, plural, not one path, into paths of righteousness. So in every uh, department of your life, in your relationships, even in respect to how you should behave towards your boss at work, the book of Colossians and Ephesians has much to say about this. How should I relate to a brother relationally? The scriptures have much to say about that. All these are God's righteous expectations for how His sons on the earth should govern their lives. Now financially too, it is not left to you to decide what you should give to God and how you should govern and administer your financial giving. The Bible has presets which reflect God's eternal standards for giving. We call this righteousness. Amazingly, when Abel gave a first fruit to the Lord, God, in a sense, was activated to witness to what the man did. And God said, righteous. God's conclusion on what Abel did was, this man is righteous. In other words, what Abel did in giving a first fruit offering exactly mirrored and was a reflection of something in the eternal realm. And it cajoled God, it incited God 
to say to the man that he is righteous. I just want to digress for a moment here by drawing reference to the eternality of first fruits. Because what Abel did reflected an eternal principle in the realm of the heavens where God is. The man did something on earth and it provoked God because it touched a nerve in God because it was something embedded within the realm of eternal that somebody in the earth in time was able to do. Many people have various problems with the relevance of first fruits and even tides today. You can just Google this and you will see anti-first fruit arguments or anti-tithe arguments. In the document that um, I will publish, I present more than 20 arguments for the relevancy and the applicability of first fruit giving and even tithes for New Testament believers today. But one of the issues that you must factor into your mind is this, that first fruits has got very little to do with what happens in time in reference to its origins. The origins of the first fruit principle existed way before there was an earth, way before there were humans, way before a church was conceived in the earth. It finds its genesis within the very nature of God Himself. The Godhead is triune. It's three parts. Father God is Ab or Abba, meaning progenitor, the first in a series. He is the first or functional head of deity. He occupies a firstness amongst the three, not in reference to substance, because they are all equal in substance, but in reference to functionality, is the functional head of the Godhead. The Son, Jesus Christ, in Scripture, is called the firstborn of God, the firstborn from the dead. He's also referenced as the first fruit or the firstborn in or from creation. The Holy Spirit Himself is also referenced when He is deposited within our spirit as the first fruit of God, as the guarantee. The Hebrew word is Arabon, denoting that He being the first installment of all that is still to come of the fullness of the Father and the fullness of the Son resident within our beings. If you think about the Lord Jesus, He is Alpha and Omega. He is first and He is last. He is the beginning and He is the ending. These terms, Alpha, these terms, first, these terms, beginning, denote who essentially He is in nature, in character. The firstness, the first principle, the first fruit reality is a reality that is thoroughly embedded within the very fabric of the person of God. It has nothing to do with law, with Old Testament versus New Testament. Its origins can be found in the very essence of the God that we serve even before time began. Now what I do find interesting is that in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, which is the very first verse in the entire Bible, it says, In the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. The word beginnings here in the Hebrew is reshith. Reshith is one of the Hebrew words translated in English as first fruits. The English first fruits can be translated such from three different Hebrew words. The one is Bekor or Bekorim. The other is, as I've said, Reshith. And the other is a very well-known 
teruma, a teruma offering, a first fruit offering, although teruma describes a whole range of offerings. The point I want to make here is this. You could reread Genesis 1 verse 1 like this. Instead of saying, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth, you could say, in the first fruits God made the heavens and the earth. To the Western minds, when we use the word beginning, we are thinking of the start of a successive wave of time events. So don't think of beginning as the commencement of time. Don't think of it, it's the start of seconds that are going to go into minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, decades, and centuries. Don't think of in the beginning in that fashion. Jesus is the beginning. You could read it like, in Christ Jesus, God made the heavens and the earth. For everything that was made, was made in and through Him and for Him. Now, to the Hebrew mind, it's not the commencement of time. As much as it is, what happens in time? Right? Modern day Westerners are more focused on the passing of moments, the passage of time. The Jewish Hebrew mind is more focused on what happens in time as a priority or what is foremost within. That is how you must read Genesis 1 verse 1. Here is my paraphrase of Genesis 1 verse 1. Instead of saying, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth, it could be reread like this. At the highest priority, or as a first concern, God primarily and preeminently created the heavens and the earth. So it is foremost, it is first in God's set of priorities to create heaven, or the heavens, plural, and the earth. On the earth, he would create the apex of his creation, which is man in his image and his likeness. Attendant with man would be man's responsibility to represent all that God is to the entirety of creation and also to steward vast aspects of the unfolding and progressive nature of God's will. Let me say it like this. Outside of man, heaven or the heavens and the earth have absolutely no relevance. God has purpose attached to humanity, particularly humans who will function as his sons. So God has that in mind. But to achieve that, God has to create structure. God has to have heavens and the earth. And in the first fruits, foremost on his mind, as a priority, he creates the heavens and the earth, not as ends in and of themselves, but God has in mind that these, heaven will contain the will of the Lord. Heaven is God's throne, not God's home. Heaven is not an eternal reality. Heaven is a created reality, right? God doesn't live in heaven. He lives outside of heaven. Heaven cannot contain all that God is. Publicly, all that the scriptures say is heaven is simply his throne from which he expedites his will to be done on the earth. And so God as a first fruit primary activity made this because he has another priority in mind, which is the creation of man in his image and that this man will represent him to all of creation and be the agency in and through which his will will be effectively communicated to the entirety of all creation. I want you to get this principle within your mind. If you apply this now to first fruit giving, first fruits has got very little to do with money, while it has much to do with money because money is the way in which you express your honor and your trust in God. But don't look at what you are doing financially 
without casting your mind to what is happening eternally. There is an eternality, an eternal dimension attached to what you are doing in time. And you know, it's so um, typical of human behavior. We always want to be engaged in activity that is temporal, that has got no lasting eternal weight and value. My heart is to always engage in activity that bears reference to what is true in the eternal realm and that will have generational impact. Okay? And I want to encourage you with this. Your first fruit, like God's first fruit activity in creating heaven and earth so that other aspects of His will could be effective. What your first fruit does is this. It sets up structure in your world. It sets up an environment, if you would. It sets up a context where other aspects of the will of the Lord will run efficiently and take place smoothly within your life. I don't have time to lay it out here, but every single person, particularly in the New Testament, in persons like Barnabas, for example, that was used significantly by God in key aspects of His vast and significant will, first, had to prove themselves faithful in the management of money. The one determines the other. And I say to you prophetically this morning, when you do engage your first fruit, most of you it would be the first week in February this year, think of it like this. This act is setting up structure, not just for my financial blessing, not just for material blessing. Our eye is really not on these things. We want to please the Lord. But what I can guarantee you from God's word is, you will set up thrones, heavenly thrones, from which God will expedite His will in your earth, in your context, for your life, for your family, for your business. This will run smoothly and will run efficaciously. So Abel, listen very carefully, he gives a first fruit offering. God stands back and God says, righteous. Why? Because righteousness in a man is only an expression of something that God has predetermined in the realm of the heavens before time began. All that Abel is doing by his action, he brings to bear upon his earthly activity an eternal dimension. It's like the weight of the eternal suddenly starts to attend him. Unfortunately for Abel, Cain, his brother, was jealous that his first fruit offering was accepted and his donation to God was rejected. Cain kills Abel. Okay? The first murder in Scripture centered around a first fruit offering. Think about it like this. The first time a human right for life was violated was because some human in the person of Abel chose to honor God with first fruits and that found acceptability with God and the one who killed him's offering did not find acceptance with the Lord. And you know, there's even in today's context, brothers are murdering brothers based upon favor that some brothers are finding with God because of their compliance to righteousness. Now you might say to me, Randolph, sad end to Abel after all of that wonderful talk about the man. No, it's not. Because Hebrews says this specifically about him. That he obtains a witness that he was righteous. And though being dead, yet he still speaks. Now from what I know of dead people, and in the light of the current COVID-19 pandemic, I've administered a few funerals. Very close friends of mine have passed away as well in my age bracket. So I suppose as for many of you listening, um, the recent few weeks and months have been very, very uh, sad occasions for, for many of us. And the principle and smell of death is all around us. 
I want to challenge you with this thought. It is possible, even too, if you have to die, to live beyond your death in reference to your impact on the earth. Because while Abel died, the scripture says, yet he still speaks. And you know what the Bible says? That when God confronted Cain concerning the murder of his brother, God said this to Cain, that the blood of your brother is crying out from the ground. A lot of people say the blood of Abel cried out for vengeance, but yet that is nowhere in the scripture. All the Bible says in the book of Genesis is that God told Cain that your brother's blood cries out. Okay, The book of Hebrews will tell us that the blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cried out for justice, not vengeance per se. The blood of Abel cried out for a just response from God in the heavens, for an injustice leveled against him. God applied the necessary judgment upon Cain. He was banished. But in the administration of the judgment of God, we also see the mercy of God on Cain in that God put a mark on his forehead and he imposed repercussions, uh, I don't know how many times over, of any human being on the earth that would ever take vengeance on Cain. So in the judgment of God on Cain, we do see expressions of his mercy. The blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel. For when Jesus died on the cross, his blood too appealed to his father for justice. And the justice and judgment of God in reference to the death of Jesus was so satisfied in that Jesus bore the penalty for the sins of the entirety of humanity. The important point I want to say is this. Two things. He who gives first fruit offerings can break the limitations of time and flesh. Because even when his time is up, he still speaks. Abel is still speaking to this generation. Abel's example of a first fruit offering set a foundation, I believe, even for Abraham, who would one day sacrifice his firstborn son, Isaac. Templates, patterns, structures were established in Abel's obedience. Might I challenge all of us who are listening, when we obey this principle, don't think narrowly. Cast your gaze beyond the immediacy even of the present time and think like this. I'm establishing structures, foundations, templates, even for generations to come that will draw upon my example of faithfulness and obedience to the Lord. Dead people don't speak, yet Abel still speaks. Dead people cannot communicate, yet dead Abel is still communicating. First Fruits has got the capacity to break natural limits. And I pray for all of us that as we obey this principle, whatever in your life seems like an impasse, you hit a roadblock, you've come to a hurdle, there's a wall in front of you. I pray that this grace principle attendant with first fruit offerings will be your portion in the name of Jesus. I pray you will go beyond what humans prescribe as your limitation. You will go to the next level in your business, in your workspace, in your personal relationships, and particularly in reference to the rate at which the nature and the will of God can be effected within your life in the name of Jesus. Now, Abel's offering was an expression of absolute trust in the Lord. And those who trust in the Lord will be, Mount, will be like Mount Zion, the Scripture says, strong and immovable. These are all traits of a righteous man. God witnessed to Abel's offering that this man is righteous. 
And I just want to give you a few more scriptures in reference to this. When you are faithful financially, particularly in reference to first fruit giving, what you must set your eye on as a reward is not financial blessing in and of itself, although you will be blessed financially. There are two things you must focus on that will come into your will. Besides everything I've mentioned, the two ingredients that you need most in your life is grace and righteousness. I will talk more about grace in the third session. But Abel is testified to by God that he has a witness that he is righteous. You know, I would think that God would have focused on any other aspect than righteousness because here a man gives an offering. All that in God say about him, you're righteous. This guy is righteous. God accentuates and focuses on the righteous compliance of Abel by what he gave. Now, in Malachi 3.3, 3, God says that he will purify the sons of Levi so that they might offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. The book of Malachi, in which the well-known uh, portion regarding tithing is mentioned, is a, uh, a command or a reprimand, if you would, directed to the leaders of the day. We often use the book of Malachi to challenge people, but 90% of the book of Malachi was written to the priesthood. It's written to leaders, and leaders more than anybody must get their financial behavior compliant to God's righteous order. This is what God says here. I will purify the priesthood the sons of Levi, my leaders. I will purify you so that you might offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Offerings must be offered in righteousness. In the book of Hosea, chapter 10 and verse 12, it says, Sow with a view to righteousness. Reap in accordance with kindness. Now notice the text. If we apply this to financial sowing, it says, what must my anticipation be whenever I sow financially? I must sow with a view to righteousness. This means two things. My sowing must be compliant to God's righteous design, which He has preset and predetermined. Secondly, when I do this in righteousness, what I can expect as a harvest is not money per se, but a harvest of increased righteousness. 1 John 3, 7 says, Who is righteous? He who practices righteousness. He is righteous even as the Lord is righteous. So the righteous person, I know we are righteous by faith, our belief in Christ, but that belief must have practical dimensions to it. And when we obey God's financial principles, we are compliant righteously. But what we can get as a reward is a growth in practical righteousness that God responds to. Now, let me just quickly uh, read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, from 6 to 9. And this really uh, further elucidates this whole principle that the giver of finances can generate or reap a harvest of righteousness. Verse 6, I say this to you, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Each one must do as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly, nor of a necessity or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. All grace, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you will have an abundance for every good work. These scriptures are well known, well taught, well preached all over the earth, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. 
Many people stop here at verse 10. All the blessings of sowing and reaping, so much you can reap much. God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace, and we stop there. If you continue reading, the scripture says in verse 9, as it is written, the phrase, as it is written, could be paraphrased as, because of this truth. I've said all of that, Paul is saying, because of this important reality. And he quotes Psalm 112 and he says, He scattered abroad and he gave to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Notice, his righteousness endures forever. And this is a direct quote from Psalm 112. Twelve, the giving of first fruits or any other expression of finances will recruit for you an enduring righteousness. Now let me say this quite definitively and significantly. What God blesses is righteousness. What God is attracted to is righteousness. When you think of your financial obedience, don't think rands and cents. Think righteousness. When you're doing your calculations and you're positioning your heart to give to the Lord, don't think of the act as an observance. Don't think of I'm obeying a ritual or I'm obeying a principle in God's word. Your mindset must be this. I am by this activity complying with something that God has established in the heavens. When I obey this, what's going to come to me is an enduring righteousness to which the blessing of the Lord will forever be attracted. Now, the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 9, I've read verse 9, as it is written, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And then it says the following. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of not your money but your righteousness. Look at the text clearly. It says you will increase the harvest of your righteousness and you will be enriched in everything for liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to the Lord. Now, I want to challenge you, church. The Bible says here that God does not give seed to a non-sower. It says God specifically gives seed to the sower. He gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now while he gives seed to the sower, and let me just stop here and challenge, those of you who are not giving, don't have seed because you are not giving. God doesn't give seed to a non-sower. If you are going to thrive and grow in financial seed sowing of any kind, you have got to decide in your heart, I am going to be the best sower that I know. You see, God gives, in Daniel it says, He gives wisdom to the wise. The guy is already wise, and God gives him wisdom. Here is a sower. He's already sowing. The Bible says God gives seed to the sower. God gives the capacity to sow more seed to the one that is already sowing seed. And then it says, then God will increase something. He says, number one, he won't multiply your bread for eating, but he'll multiply your seed for sowing. Okay? Because God knows that when he multiplies seed in the hands of a bona fide faithful sower, that person continues to sow and generate harvests of blessing, including righteousness and grace. And that person will have the wherewithal to have bread to eat. But it specifically says he multiplies the seed sown and increases 
the harvest, not of money, but increases the harvest of righteousness. The greatest commendation that God gave to a man in the earliest part of human history is to stand back from the height of the heavens and say to the man, righteous. This is my verdict on you, Abel. Righteous by what you have given. Because in righteousness, God blesses you. The Bible said of Noah, Genesis 6 verse 8, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And the very next verse tells us, and Noah was a righteous man in his generation. Romans chapter 5 and verse 21 contains a very important principle. It says that grace will reign through righteousness. If you think about it like this, if my hand here represents grace and this other hand righteousness, grace looks for a context in which to grow and thrive. It's called righteousness. God is able to make to the financial seed sower that is faithful. He's able to make all grace abound to you because God is looking for a righteous act in you to offload quantums and more downloads of His grace into your world. God is able to make all grace abound to the one that is faithful. That grace looks for a, an environment, if you would, a container. The container of grace is called righteousness. Psalm 84 says that the Lord God is a sun and shield, and He gives grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from him who walks uprightly. The word uprightly means righteousness. So it says God gives grace and glory to the one that is upright. Whenever you comply with God's expectation to be righteous by the expression of your first fruit offerings, what I can assure you of, you will have downloads, offloads of the grace of God into your world and what God will bless is your righteous state. The Bible says and God is able to make all grace abound to you. It doesn't say He's able to make all money abound to you. You see when you have grace resident in righteousness, Romans 5 21, grace reigns in or grace reigns through righteousness. When you have grace, you will have everything else that you need to survive even in calamitous economic conditions. God is able to sustain you by virtue of your compliance to His eternal demands. So my prayer for you and I today is that God from the heights of the heavens, from the realm of eternity, in the invisible and the unseen, who functions by righteousness. Righteousness is the foundation of His throne, the Scripture says. He looks for righteous activity in men. When He finds it, He finds Himself. He offloads grace to that activity and those people. That grace is all that those individuals need to be successful in life. Let me just say this to you. The grace of God within you will generate blessings within your life. Like Abel, you will have the regard of God, the favor of God. You will be able to have a witness from God Himself of your state. And whatever God testifies to positively, God is able to bless. And like Him, though being dead, yet He speaks, you too, in your world, will be able to step over impasses, hindrances, prescriptions, limitations, circumscriptions that people have hemmed you in and you feel 
uh, like in prison, in case. You can transcend those by your obedience to a first fruit principle, which is righteous compliance to God's predetermined, preset mind for you in your life. Again, as we close, I want to challenge you with this. Think righteousness. Don't think money. Because if your lean or your bend is towards to be righteously compliant to God's expectation of you, what will happen is God will regard you. And God will increase your grace content. And like the scripture says, multiply your seed sown and increase the harvest of your practical righteousness. And wherever there is righteousness, there is great blessing attached to your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you that in you we live and move and have being. Our greatest desire is to walk in every path of righteousness for your name's sake. I ask, O oh God, that as your people have heard this word, we bow our hearts and our commitment is to your righteousness. Help us to be like Abel, to be righteously compliant, not to have our own opinions about what we should do financially, but to bow to the principles in your word, to access them and activate them in our lives. I pray for every single one that has listened today. I pray we would all walk in righteousness, that we would say the words of Jesus, suffer it to be so now, for in this way we must do the right thing. We must fulfill an eternal heavenly design. God, I pray that as we obey the first fruit principle, all of eternity would come to look, all of heaven would come to rest and rest in what we do. We know that this is an eternal principle. And in time, in this year, as we engage obediently, I pray for every family, for every businessman, for every working man and woman, in the name of Jesus, every child, every adolescent, every young adult that would engage this practice. I pray that they would know of a certainty that as they do something righteously, that they lock into the eternality of the principle. That you in whom the principle is resident before time even began, that Father, Son and Holy Ghost would bring to be brought to bear in our environments. That when eternity comes in a temporal environment, it will totally displace things that hamper us in our temporality. Like even Abel, we can transcend the greatest enemy, even death, in this time period. I even dare to pray, Father, that for some of us, we're going to escape death by virtue of our obedience to this specific principle. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? I thank you, O oh God, that the entire spirit world that is yours will come to express itself within our domains, our homes, our workplaces, our relationships, that everything about us will smell of the eternal when we engage in this practice in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, thank you, church. Thank you, Dr. Ben and Sonia. Thank you for listening for, uh, to this partic particular broadcast. Uh, we will continue next week in our last installment within the series. And I encourage you to lock in with great faith and expectation next week. Great grace and abundant peace be yours in Jesus' name.